Okay, so we switch to supermassive black holes, and the first talk will be by Chang Pima on supermassive black holes and core scoring. Hey, thank you. Uh, I'll switch the gear a little bit now uh, to uh, the local universe and to massive galaxies and their central supermassive black holes. Uh, so before getting into the black holes, I thought I'd just give a quick update on the massive survey, which I talked about a year ago here. Um, and uh, we've made some progress. So um, and studying supermassive black hole is one of the primary goals of the survey. So I thought I'll first update you on what's going on. So this is a uh, survey of the local universe uh, of uh, the 100 most massive galaxies within about 100 megaparsecs. And uh, like the primary collaborator is Jenny Green and a uh, number of um, associates. And um, I would like to highlight contribution from UC Berkeley students. And, we, uh, and this is to study the st mostly the stellar mass content and dark matter and black hole content of these galaxies. We, we also have parallel surveys going on um, in, with HST and there's a gas and then x-ray surveys, which I'll talk about. I'll just present some very preliminary results. And the survey paper was published last year. The, uh, the f stellar population gradient paper, since we, for each galaxy, we're able to reach out to about two effective radii. Uh, that paper, the first of those papers have been published by uh, Jenny Green et al. And we have a molecular gas seal detection paper that's submitted, uh, we will post to archive soon. And there are a number of black hole related uh, and the main stellar kinematic papers and ionized gas actually paper, they're all quite mature uh, and we're working on finishing them. So what is this survey? It's an IFU survey of nearby most massive galaxies. We chose the selection, if I had to, we tried to keep it simple. So we would like to do a volume limited and it's based on, um, purely based on stellar mass selection. So stellar mass larger than 10 to the 11.5. And we use the uh, two mass K-band magnitude as a proxy for stellar mass. Of course, our kinematic measurements will eventually tell us not just the total stellar mass, but also the distribution of stellar mass within each galaxy. And it's also multi-wavelength, as I mentioned, and, and there's a significant photometric component to this too. And the idea is for each galaxy, we will get very detailed, spatially resolved, two-dimensional kinematics and to study various properties of these modes of gas. Uh, most massive galaxies, early types, and their central black holes. Um, and I don't think this audience needs to be reminded of why these galaxies are important. Uh, obviously, they're probably hosts of some of the most, most massive black holes nearby. Uh, I don't have time to get into gravity waves here, but I was just at a, a pulsar timing conference in Australia, um, and the pulsar timing community now is getting sensitive uh, oh, uh, 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 maybe per, uh, detecting gravity waves, at least putting upper limits on gravity waves due to supermassive binary black holes, in contrast to LIGO, which is targeting stellar mass black holes. And so these uh, the massive surveys um, black holes are actually, their, probably will be the, their primary candidates. And of course, these massive galaxies are probably quiescent counterparts of high rest luminous quasars. And, Redshift two massive star forming or compact galaxies. Some of them probably evolved into these most massive ellipticals today. And of course, the AGN feedback and various properties um, are very active probably in these uh, galaxies. So again, why another galaxy survey? There have been so many of them. Uh, here, I, I just want to highlight that uh, the parameter space we're probing actually had not, had not been explored so much in the prior studies. You would think all these galaxies, most of them are NGC something, uh, they have been studied by Sloan or other surveys, but actually only about two thirds of our galaxies have, have Sloan photometry, let alone Sloan spectra. Only about a fifth of them are uh, in the Sloan footprint. And again, uh, rem remember that Sloan's fiber is just a single fiber of three arc second. We, are, uh, we have 250 fibers covering 107 arc second uh, across. So we are studying each galaxy in much more detail. And compared to Alice 3D, which I'll show you a slide, we are, uh, there are only six overlapping galaxies because we are targeting the very, very massive end. So our volume is much bigger. And with slugs, two slugs is taken from the Alice 3D uh, with very large field of view. 
nematic study, there are only two of our galaxies are in slugs. And our galaxies, I won't have too much time to go into the details here, but in our papers, we presented more uh, environmental studies. You may think the most massive galaxies live in the most massive clusters. Uh, sure enough, Virgo, um, Coma, Perseus, their BCGs, or, or you know, their brightest galaxies are in our sample. Uh, but in fact, most of these are not in well-known rich cl clusters. Some of them are in fossil groups. Some seem to be in fairly isolated environments. So I, the halo mass that we spend, uh, in fact, is quite broad. We don't have very precise measurements of halo masses, of course. Uh, but this is a stellar mass selected survey. And uh, very quickly, the sample selection, again, just to contrast Atlas 3D, the prior uh, very comprehensive and extensive study of local early type galaxies, uh, we are much, much brighter. So the corresponding stellar mass is tentatively 11.5 or higher. And our volume is much bigger. Uh, Alice 3D is also volume limited. They go out to 42 megaparsecs. So many of their galaxies are in the Virgo cluster. We've chosen 108, far enough to just include the Coma cluster. Uh, so that's why there are so few overlapping galaxies, because most of our, our um, galaxies are more massive than what they are able to probe. Galaxy, massive galaxies are rare. So you got to go to bigger volume before you can find them. Uh, Morphology-wise, we, uh, we chose early types and as, as a northern uh, sky survey. And the instruments we use for the spectroscopic part involve basically two uh, fields of views. The, sort of the, the working workhorse for our um, survey is the wide field IFU on the McDonald 2.7 meter, these are very bright galaxies. Uh, and this is a particularly e efficient and one of the biggest, largest fields of view IFU. So here's their publicity fiber plot. You can see, I mean, we're not studying spiral galaxies, but it's just to showcase that in one shot, we have 250 fibers. And each fiber is, is fat. It's four arc second um, in, in diameter. So you can think of Sloan fiber being sort of the central fiber. Okay, but here we cover a much larger field of view and in the optical range. Uh, and the idea, of course, is to we want to get out not only studying the central sigma or uh, numbers for these galaxies, but we would like to see how the galaxy as a whole, uh, you know, its gradients and stellar populations and kinematics and IMFs and so on. And uh, for a subset of these 100 galaxies, we are pursuing uh, further kinematic studies using high resolution. So this is really resolving the very inner fiber. Uh, and this requires either CAG or Gemini, the 10, 8 to 10 meter telescopes. And we are trying both with NIFS or OSIRIS with AO on and, or, and seeing limited GMOS, which uh, uh, gets us much higher signal to noise. And this is to map the stellar kinematics at the very center of the subset of galaxies in order to do black hole modeling. And we also now require deep K-band photometry for every galaxy in a survey using CFHT or Euchre uh, cameras. And the reason being two mass is a very shallow uh, all-sky survey. So the K-band magnitudes, which we rely on and everybody else relies on, uh, for these very massive galaxies may be an underestimate. So we would like to get better photometry uh, by going to further uh, the outer part of each galaxy. And we're analyzing these data right now. And we have a uh, parallel uh, IRAM uh, PDBI, HST, Chandra, Alma um, uh, data collecting collection going on right now. So just one plot about the parameter space we are sitting in. Uh, just very simple distance to the galaxy and the uh, absolute k-band magnitude to contrast the parameter space we're in to that of the 260 galaxies in the LS3D survey. Uh, again, they are volume limited to 42. We are volume limited to 108 megaparsecs. And as a result, you can see that M87 is one of the biggest galaxies uh, of their survey. But by opening up this volume, we are able to we find, we discover, not discover, we include many more massive galaxies. Of course, we can't go down to such a thing. We would like to go down to uh, fainter magnitudes in future surveys. But now we're limiting to the brightest part uh, of uh, this parameter space. And NGC 4089 is the BCG of Coma, so that's still sort of the biggest one 
in terms of stellar masses. M87 is actually, there are many, many M87-like galaxies in terms of stellar masses uh, in our survey, but not in terms of environments. Okay. Um, so about uh, the current status of the survey, the, we have about data for 70 of these galaxies now. We are preparing uh, the first kinematic paper on 40 of them, which are the 40 brightest ones, the most massive ones. And, um, and we have 30 others uh, also with the Mitchell IFU, and we are pursuing uh, getting more observations. So here the idea is we would like to get the velocity distributions of the stars in the galaxies over a 2D um, grid on the sky, and we would like to go beyond V and sigma. Our signal to noise is chosen to be high enough so that we can also get the skewness, the kurtosis, the higher moment of this velocity distribution. And these tails are very important for telling us, giving us more information about what the stars are doing. And in particular, in the black hole modeling, these tails are uh, the high velocity stars uh, are, are very important. Okay, and we're doing extensive surveys. So this, this is relevant for other IFU surveys, such as Manga, to see which stellar spectral range we want to include, which, uh, ones, which lines give us more robust uh, velocity, moment, velocity moments, and so on. Uh, for the subset that we have also have better spatial resolution data for, uh, we identify at least 20 galaxies that we can do uh, obtain uh, AO data or jet, uh, GMOS data for. We have in hand now of 15 um, new kinematic, uh, kinematic data for uh, 15 more uh, new black hole measurements, and we're, we're working on these right now. So among these seven of these galaxies have published black hole masses, a few by ourselves earlier on, and we're expecting to add uh, 15 more, probably at least, uh, and this is all at the very high mass end of the parameter space. And I'll show you the black hole correlation uh, parameter in a second. Okay, and again, the, the deep K-band data are very useful, and the HHST, we just obtained um, 34 orbits that will allow us to get the uh, central surface brightness of the uh, 34 more galaxies that had no prior archival data. And those are very, very important for both constraining the black hole mass in our modeling and also for the core profile, which I'll talk about in a second. And I, I want to also highlight uh, the importance of getting distances. Uh, as a th theorist, I had thought distances are, you know, you just get distances. Uh, these nearby galaxies, shouldn't we know about their distances? Uh, not so. Uh, Virgo uh, had a very good surface brightness fluctuation measurements to the Virgo cluster, coma also. But for most of these galaxies, we struggled uh, since we needed the distances to convert the apparent magnitude to absolute magnitude. And we actually had to do all these redshift correction, bulk flow, so on and so forth. So we decided, well, that will, could be a very nice goal for the HST data we get. And another very important thing here is black hole mass depends linearly with the distances. We only measure things in the angular scales. So to convert things into a black hole mass, you need to know the distance. This, this uh, systematics is often um, sort of swept under the carpet. Okay, so any errors on the distances get mapped into the errors in the black holes. So we would like to get a surface brightness fluctuation distance, which will allow us to get distances to within 5%. Okay, so uh, just to show you a few uh, sort of results, I, I, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the survey results. I would like to move on to the black holes. But uh, just uh, these are sort of new plots from uh, Melanie Veal, who's a graduate student at Berkeley, who's uh, uh, leading the kinematic part of the study. So just to show you the angular momentum profiles for just some set, set of our galaxies. Uh, this is just, I think, the first 16 we're looking at. Uh, we're going to publish the first 40 uh, most uh, brightest ones. And this is a lambda profile, just to show you that, uh, as expected in this mass range, uh, many of these should be slow rotators or almost non-rotators. And this is exactly the parameter space where Alice 3D had very few uh, data points for. Right? They, their main discovery is early type galaxies, most of them are fast rotators, which is fine. Uh, but those are, a lot of those are S0 galaxies, and they're at lower masses. We're probing this higher, higher mass range. You can see there are a few fast rotators. 
So we should be able to get the fraction and get the statistics yeah. out of our survey. So do you want to this Romans S0 as well? Yeah, so we we're sure how to do a E versus S0 cut. So uh, the, our morphology in, didn't cut all S0s. So who Hyperlida said E or S0, we included them. Uh, these uh, yeah, I think a couple are well known as zeros. Yes. And there's actually correlation between that and the uh, content of CO. So I'll show you CO next. Okay, so this is in the Tim Davis's paper that we submitted. And just to um, report that our pilot program using around 30 meters, uh, basically the idea here is to ask, do these massive galaxies have CO? And this is an integrated me measure over about 10, 10 arc seconds. So we don't have spatial information with ARM 30 meters. But a uh, primary result out of the ALICE 3D survey is that fast rotators tended to have CO. And the, the slower non-rotators, a very massive end, there was basically no gas, very little sign of gas. But here, we, uh, as a pilot, we targeted 11 targets. They were selected to be uh, our best chances for detecting CO based on either the presence of HST dust lanes or 22 micron uh, access. These are known to be correlated with the presence of CO. We targeted 11, and we actually made seven, uh, six of those we had detections. And they're detected both in CO1 to 0 and CO2 to 1. These are the six galaxies. And uh, quite a few of them show the beautiful double horn profiles. So in our paper, we uh, report the Tolly fisher CO relation and so on. But I just want to show you that um, there are actually detections. It will be very nice to know uh, with higher res spatial resolution observation is to know where the gas actually is and if it's near the center. It have been shown recently a couple of very nice um, examples where the CO forms a disk and that becomes a new tracer for um, a black hole measurement. We don't know right now whether these are good enough. Okay? Uh, and then the, this is just show you the parameter space in sigma, velocity dispersion of our galaxies versus the K by magnitude of where they're detected. There are four others that have been detected of our galaxies, massive galaxies that had been detected in CO in the literature. So I just want to highlight that nine out of the 10 total detections, CO detections, are in the fainter half of our sample. So right, uh, the fainter than minus 25.7. These are all the massive galaxies. So we have an ongoing program targeting more, more randomly, uh, just to see, to give a demographics of a CO content in these most massive galaxies. So let me now just, uh, Spent five minutes on the, uh, the black hole aspect of our survey. And again, just to highlight that this is, I'm talking about a very massive end, although we don't have, we did not apply any cuts on sigma. Okay, our galaxies are selected based, based on stellar mass. But since any sigma is such a popular plot to show, I'm showing you uh, the, the, these are the currently, uh, cur sort of the current about 80 ga galaxies that have dynamical black hole measurements. Okay, uh, massive is only targeting the very, very high mass. And, and these are, this is a compilation from many people's work, masers, gas, and stellar kinematics. Okay, and, and if you look at the very top end, these galaxies, these black holes tended to be overmassive, and it looks like sigma starts to saturate. You just don't find galaxies much more than 400 kilometers per second in sigma. The black hole masses could, could go up. So the M sigma correlation starts to become, uh, to have larger intrinsic scatter at a high mass end, or the high, also the high sigma end. So again, I want to focus to the very central um, light profile of these massive galaxies. It's been known for a long time, thanks to Sandy and others, that very massive galaxies, this is the surface brightness, uh, tended to have core profiles. And you can see, uh, so, so these solid curves are, are the core ones, and they tended to be more luminous than the power law ones. So we have put this into a unit I understand better. So that's solar luminosities per parsec squared, okay, versus parsec. And just to highlight, again, the variation in the inner light profiles of many elliptical galaxies with HST profiles. A lot of these are taken from uh, Lauer at all 07. Okay, again, I want to highlight these thick five lines show some of the most massive black holes known to date. Uh, M87 is here, 
4472, I guess this is M49, I think. And then these two orange ones are the two 10 billion solar mass black holes um, Nicholas McConnell and uh, our group uh, detected. And you can see a tremendous flattening okay, in the light profile toward the center, meaning there's a deficit of stars here in relation to the lower mass elliptical galaxies. So there's very little light and very little mass in the core. And some of the cores can get to be about one kiloparsec. Okay, these are the very, very distinct um, um, observational signatures of these massive galaxies. So as I mentioned earlier, sigma seem to be start to saturate here. So one could ask, could the core size uh, be a better correlation with black hole mass? And this had been looked at before, but we now um, sort of sorted out. Uh, there are 21 okay, uh, elliptical galaxies that are cored and that have dynamically measured black hole masses. So you look at this subsample by themselves, then uh, this is the correlation between black hole mass and the core radius. Now just a caveat on the core radius, there are various ways you can fit to the light profile. Uh, the new team had a broken power law kind of uh, parameterization, and that's good for the inner part of the light profile. You can do that and determine uh, uh, our break, the break radius, the core radius, and that's the blue dots here. Or you could use a core CERSIC profile, which is better for sort of the overall galaxy. So you have a CERSIC, but you introduce a core, the center. So there's another parameter as a break radius. I mean, they don't give you the same answer, but that's okay. I mean, as long as you compare within the sample one method. Uh, so look at the blue ones and the, green, uh, the red ones separately. They're just two different ways of characterizing that break. But the point here is that the intrinsic scatter in this relationship is only 0.3 dec. Uh, if you look at M sigma for this sample alone, that intrinsic scatter is a lot, a lot bigger. Okay, so core radius, uh, and this has been pointed out um, in some other papers. We have just a few more data points here. Okay, so if you want to have a proxy for black hole demographics in any kind of uh, semi-analytic modeling, Core, ma uh, core size is a better proxy than sigma at the massive end. And the last uh, sort of result I'll show here is we can further look at the black hole sphere of influence, which is defined to be the radius at which, uh, within which the enclosed stellar mass equals that of the black hole. Okay, we're not using GM over sigma square anything. We just, since we have the model for every black hole, we know where this radius is because we're modeling the stellar distribution in black hole at the same time. So what's plotted here, and this is a new plot in preparation uh, in Jens Thomas and our group's uh, plot, uh, we just compare the sphere of influence radius with that break radius, again, depending on which one you want to choose, these are the two lines, but it has a very, very tight correlation. The intrinsic scatter for this sample is 0.17 dec. Okay, so basically telling you that the core formation is intimately connected to the black hole dynamics. And of course, we've heard a lot about in the literature that binary black hole uh, could have a three-body scattering, kicking out radial orbit uh, stars to cause the flattening. That certainly is a very good um, model. It right now, it can explain the velocity and isotropies, the core size correlation, everything. I would like to pose to this audience, who, who, there are a lot of simulators here, that whether black hole feedback, okay, not through gravitational three-body scattering, but if you have AGN feedback, can you reproduce this tight correlation? Can you reproduce a core radius uh, that's intimately create, uh, re related to the uh, uh, break radius start uh, profile? Okay, so let me just summarize. Uh, the massive survey is in good progress. And we're targeting a new parameter space. And uh, we're pretty excited about the new HST photometry because it was 34 orbit. We're just expecting data now. We just got approved. And that should add 34 more uh, curves to the surface brightness profile I just showed. And we expect to find many more cord galaxies here. And CO and ionized gas have been detected. And we're studying the demographics here, which galaxies tended to have uh, gas. And then for the core part, again, I want to emphasize that now observations are showing a very clear sign of giant stellar cores that ha 
have a um, fairly tight correlation with the black hole mass. Okay? And so indicating that this core formation is homogeneous and closely related to the black holes. So I know there's a lot of discussion about dark matter cores in dwarf galaxies through supernova feedback and so on. So again, I want to emphasize that. Now this, I think, is a very interesting observational uh, challenge to the modelers. Can you produce this kind of observational signatures? Thank you. Time for a couple of questions. I was wondering whether you have any constraints on uh, potential offsets between where you seek the peak in the velocity dispersion with respect to the the center from the photometry, especially in those cores. Do you ever see any offset that's detectable? Or? Right. Uh, so it depends on the source. Uh, the most probably well-known offset is in 4889, the one we found the whatever 10 plus billion solar mass black hole. Uh, that's why our error bars on the black hole measurement is so large, is the photometric center and the kinematic center are offset by about one arc second. And as you know, the current Schwarzschild models cannot, no model can handle this kind of offset. So we tried different quadrants. But whatever we did to the data, I always wanted a very massive black hole. But our error bars as a result is very big. But for some others, it's very clean. 3849 is right on. I, I had the question. Uh, so um, there was a, a galaxy for which the core size in one of the estimator was two KPCs. That's right. right. So there are, um, there are a couple well-known ones. One is by Postman et al. And there's another one by the Spanish group. Um, uh, they are 2 plus KPC, but they are very distant. They're at um, 200 plus megaparsecs. So we looked at that. Uh, I think current, can, you, you, current teles generation telescopes cannot get a black hole measurement. It's just too distant. So you can't get enough signal to noise. It would be good for the 30 meter telescopes. But the, if you use the core size to infer the black hole mass, it could be 10 to the 11th. That's what it would indicate. So it would be nice to have a direct measurement. You decide. Hi, <laughs> Tom. Uh, what's the probability that your sample would actually contain any binary black holes based upon the numbers you've seen or could have detected that were larger separated versus those that are small, which I presume die off much more quickly. Right. That's a great question. I was just at a pulsar timing conference in Australia, so those folks are very interested in the binary right. fraction. I think it's, it's very, very small probability. But we are inverting the question now. We are using their pulsar timing data uh, to constrain what kind of binary black holes are allowed in, say, M87 or 4089. It's pretty tight. It's um, I don't think you can have a black hole binary of ratio anything larger than about 2%. Yeah, in 4889. 